Hello and welcome to the Art of Cinematography. I'll be going into detail about what they do, what they use, and some legends of the work. This is a quick look at cinematography. So what exactly is a cinematographer? Well, a cinematographer would also be known as a camera operator, and their job is essentially the operator of a camera for any kind of video. They will know what setup the camera needs, the way the video needs to look, look professional, and the right colours to use to make sure that the video has the right effect on the audience. A good cinematographer is essential for a good looking video, as they are the people who are capturing the footage that is going to be made into the film. An element of video that has evolved over time is the quality of video, and by the quality I mostly mean the resolution, the amount of pixels crammed into the screen. This allows for more details to be captured, and resolution has slowly increased over time as the technology matures. So let's just clear up one thing. When I talk about the resolutions, I mean as if they were on one huge screen that was beyond any resolution we know of. That is simply because if you have a 1080p video, high quality, on a little, low quality phone screen, you're not going to experience that video in the 1080p quality that it basically is. However, if you have a 480p video, a low quality video normally, on a 480p phone screen, it's going to be a good resolution because that's the resolution of the screen itself. Where if you take that 480p video, and you put it on a big 1080p TV, it's not going to be a great resolution, as the video is going to be stretched out to fit that higher quality pixels crammed into that screen. It's all about the pixels per inch. The more pixels per inch, the higher quality video it can show. The lowest resolution that is used is 240 by 320 This resolution is typically used for videos shared on the internet from mobile phones, as there will be little memory use and the upload will be quick. This kind of video will be blurred on anything but a small screen, however, as shown in the sample of video shown here. The next step up is 480 by 640 also known as VGA. This resolution is used as an improvement over 240x320, and is the resolution that CCTV cameras commonly record in, as these cameras record over a long time, and this quality of video is a good middle ground between memory use and detail. Low-end phones may also have screens that are this resolution, the small screens do not need to be high resolution to pack in detail. The next step up is 720 by 1280 also known as HD. This resolution is used for HD content such as HD channels and DVDs. This resolution is detailed and used a decent amount of memory, making it the most common resolution to this day and many phones as well as cheap televisions will have screens that are this resolution. 1080p, also known as Full HD, is an increasingly common resolution. Simply used for high quality DVDs and videos, this is an enhanced version of 720p. Blu-ray discs and next generation games consoles output the video in 1080p, and more and more forms of video are beginning to take on this higher resolution video, with the only problem being the high memory use. 4K, also known as QHD or Quad HD, is a resolution that is around but far from common. You probably aren't aware of this resolution, as not many things can record or even show videos in this quality. However, there are 4K televisions out there for an extortionate price, and some new phones can even record in 4K resolution, showing that this super high quality video is actually on the rise. Something that has definitely changed over time is the equipment that cinematographers have access to. Whereas in the past, cinematographers would have to carry a large camera and heavy tapes, the introduction of light cameras has really allowed the job to be easier, and things like optical image stabilisation mean the cinematographer can relax about having a steady hand. As technology's capabilities increase, so does the cinematographers. Modern day phones can make a professional looking video with simply their own phone camera. The entire video in the background shown here was filmed on a phone and still looks as professional as one filmed on expensive cameras, showing that a good looking film can be accomplished by anybody nowadays. So this large camera right here is a Sony HVR Z1. This is a dedicated video camera, you cannot take photos on this. However, in terms of when it comes to video, this is one of the best of the best from when it was around at its time. It has an integrated lens, as you can see down there, that is the lens. lens basically runs almost halfway down the camera, and it is a 12 times optical zoom lens, which allows you to zoom very far. I mean, your subject could be a long way away, and you could still zoom in to get some good detail there. It has also a manual focus during video, and it's fairly accurate as well, and it's very, it's very subtle, you won't notice it until it moves in. It can record for a maximum of 63 minutes, most cameras cannot do this, most cameras have a limit of about 30 minutes. Now, an interesting thing about this camera is it records 1080i video, Now, 1080i is basically 1080p but interlaced. 
And also we've caused it to tapes. Tapes slot right in there. Tapes have been mostly phased out nowadays for solid state drives. Where basically you would save it to what is essentially an internal memory stick or hard drive. And you can just plug it into a computer and take them right off there. This requires a bit more intricate work with the capturing and essentially getting the footage off the camera is a bit harder. But some people prefer the use of tapes. This camera, this camera kind, it's actually, this itself was used by the BBC until it was recently discontinued and stopped in production and made place for its newer version, the Sony Z5. Obviously there are other camera types out there, however this was used in the BBC before. As you can see it has a massive multitude of buttons on the side, this allows for a huge amount of flexibility with when you're, when you're actually shooting and there's multiple controls for the same function as you can see there is one there they can do zoom there there's a zoom ring for a bit steadier zoom and then the zoom on the top as well there's almost four different record buttons one inside of there one there and one there and I believe there's somewhere else on the camera I don't know at the moment which are basically allow us for a huge amount of flexibility when making video the only thing this doesn't have is interchangeable lenses however the lens inside of it is very capable and you wouldn't really need to change the lenses. However, some people prefer the use to be able to keep a compact camera. This is certainly not that. If I just compare it to the Samsung NX300, it's absolutely tiny compared to this camera. So generally, this camera is a dedicated video camera for hardcore film use. These aren't cheap, they're around £1,000 even nowadays, 5000 when they first came out. And yeah, essentially this is a... Uh, high-end video camera for those who make high-end videos really it could be used in the TV industry for those who with small time channels so what we have here is the Sony Handycam now the actual model number is a big long line of letters and numbers that you wouldn't really understand so I'm not going to even bother including them it still records to tapes there's a little tape opening there if you want to put a tape in there but it won't record to a internal hard drive as it does not have that one thing this camera does have though is portability. In terms of taking it out for like a ski trip or something like that and you want to record just like, you want to capture the event. This camera's pretty unrivaled for the way you can hold it, the way it just kind of sticks to your hand. It's also got a viewfinder built into it for those who want to use that as well as a screen on the side. With a 2000 times digital zoom and a 40 times optical zoom, this means this camera can zoom very far and will be used for great use for any kind of work similar to the Z1 but needed a bit more rugged and more portable ability. There is no mic input on this camera, you cannot input another mic, so the internal mic is all you have unless you use an external microphone and sync the audio. It shoots only 720p video. One massive advantage these cameras have is the price. The price is very cheap. You can buy one of these for around £100 nowadays. When they came out, they are obviously a bit more expensive, but as they've got older, they still work the same way. And you can still get them for a much lower price compared to most other cameras out there. This does not shoot photography. This is only a video camera. However, for those out there, such as a school, for example, or just someone who's interested in making films, this camera will be perfect for that kind of use. Simply because it only shoots video, it's very cheap and it's very portable, and it's good. It works with a good amount of uh, tripods, like I said, the tripod uh, mount on the bottom, and will be kind of useful for those who want to make films but don't want to spend that premium price that the uh, higher-end video cameras have. So what we have here now is the Canon 600D. Now this is a conventional DSLR, it's actually entry level, so it's one of the lower end ones. You'll see more higher end ones with higher image quality and extra features in the higher price market. But this one itself is actually not too bad, it's not too shabby. It's about £400 price mark and it really is an introduction into kind of professional, professional photography with this kind of camera. Now this camera itself has an 18 megapixel CMOS sensor. 18 megapixels is very good though, it can make some very nice images with that. It includes auto and manual focus, however there is no auto focus during video. Also, not only is the lens interchangeable, so you can get stuff like telephoto zoom lenses which can zoom much further than the conventional lens we have here. You can also plug in many things on the sides of it, there's many parts available for things that you want to add to it. This includes stuff like a microphone, there's a 3.5mm part there which a lot of microphones do use. That is on the side there. SD card slots on the side and also these things are weatherproof so this kind of camera can be taken pretty much anywhere and be be okay to use, become rain or shine it will be fine to use and that really appeals to professional photographers who need a camera that will just work wherever they take it. But this camera shoots 1080p video at 30 frames per second that's pretty much the uh, film standard 30 frames per second is a fairly average standard if you were going to go for slow motion it wouldn't be the greatest but in terms of general film work it is perfectly fine 
Now, as I said before, this, this is designed for photography and as such includes most photography features. The swivel screen is useful for video. However, the little bit here, this is the viewfinder that many of these cameras have. Pretty much any DSLR will have a viewfinder. And if you look down it, that is where you take the image from. It'll focus and it'll take the image. Which is right there, the camera can focus on. And that is the uh, image it can take, and it takes very high quality. This is essentially for stuff like uh, photo shoots. This kind of camera is what you would see. So what we have here is the Samsung NX300. It's got a 20.3 megapixel APS-C CMOS sensor, which is a high-end sensor for those with low-light photography. Now what you might be thinking here is this looks like a digital camera, and you're right, it does, which is exactly what it's pitched at. The idea is of a digital camera is it's small and lightweight, but the problem is the image quality often suffers because of it. That's where this kind of camera steps in. It allows that small size while keeping that high-end image quality. Essentially, this is a mirrorless camera. It's the convention. The difference between this and the DSLR is the DSLR has a mirror. This doesn't. The name literally is as simple as that. Also, because these don't have a mirror, they don't have a optical viewfinder, which most DSLRs do have, which allows for really kind of accurate photography, which some people prefer. However, instead, it takes images through the screen. So if you just want to point it wherever you want to take a photo off, you can take a photo very quickly thanks to its hybrid autofocus. Hybrid basically means the two different kinds of focus, the phase detection and the contrast detection, are combined to allow you to get about 105 focus points, allowing for really accurate and really fast focus, and this includes during video and photography. The camera overall is designed for photography, however, because it's uh, basically a DSLR, it allows for that flexibility to use during video. The camera itself shoots 1080p video at 50 frames per second, which is a very high frame rate. That allows for slight slow motion work, obviously not super slow motion, but it will allow for good slow motion work and allows for a really smooth video for those who want to shoot it around that frame rate with the rise of about 48 frames per second video. The camera itself does not have a mic input, it doesn't have many parts at all, it only has a HDMI and a micro USB port. However, one thing it does spot is a Samsung Smart Shoe. Essentially what this is, is the top plate here that I'm pointing at. It allows you to make a, uh, it allows you to process information through that. This includes stuff like a microphone where you can put on top. It has to be a dedicated one that allows use for it, and there's only a few of them out there. But this allows you to transfer the information through the camera and without any cables needed. Another thing this camera has is uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Now, Wi-Fi connectivity is a rising deal, simply because it allows you to transfer things from your camera to a uh, tablet or a phone through simply like Wi-Fi and this allows for a lot of uh, kind of consumer friendly things like uploading photos to Facebook from the camera such as backing it up or emailing it to people and this is a really consumer based like uh, approach however these cameras are not only consumer based with the interchangeable lenses they have you can also get a professional photographer using these these are mostly used for street photography because of their portability What about when it comes to making a film? Surely the cinematographer can't be the only role in filmmaking. Well, you're right. When making a film, the cinematographer is only a part of the production. There are multiple jobs when making a film, from the director to the sound designer. The sound designer makes sure that the film sounds right, from the small sound effects to the big musical scores, and can make some scenes go from this to sounding like this. Another key part is the director. The director makes sure everybody knows their job and what they're doing and essentially sends the film in the right direction. One exception, however, is where the cinematographer or someone such as the lighting guy or the sound guy feels that the director has made a bad decision and can give advice and recommend a different idea. If the director feels that this is a better decision, he will do just that. In recent times, the job of a cinematographer has been replaced completely with the use of drones. The drones are used during the Winter Olympics and allowed the cameras to reach places that no human could without a camera helicopter. Take a close look at this footage. You might have missed it, so here's it again in slow motion. You see the little shadow there? 
it's very likely that that is a drone, like the one shown there, which we would be able to get a good view on these skiers that no human would be able to reach and be able to track them all the way down the hill. Drones are much cheaper and less obstructive than a helicopter hovering above everyone in the crowd. Vittorio Storero was born in 1940 and still lives to this day. He was born in Rome on the 24th of June and since then is a free time Academy Award winning cinematographer. He is widely regarded as a master of cinematography, particularly when it comes to colours and the way it can change the effect that his footage can have on people. He has many iconic films, from Last Tango in Paris released in 1972 to The Sheltering Sky released in 1990 and The Fantastic Apocalypse Now released in 1979 where director Francis Ford Coppola allowed Vittorio to do what he liked with the film, making many believe that Vittorio was the master behind the film's success. Charles Washer is a two-time Academy Award winner, who was born in 1985 and passed away in 1974. He was born in London and was the first cinematographer to win an Academy Award in 1929. He studied photography while he was young, and eventually got a job as a newsreel cameraman shortly before moving to the United States in 1909. Rocha then opened his own movie studio alongside David Horsley in Hollywood in 1911. This move allowed him to become a full-time cameraman and the first cinematographer in Hollywood. He was one of the founders of the American Society of Cinematographers and he was the first vice president. He is seen as a huge influence on cinematography and modern day filmmaking. He received multiple awards shortly before his death. He has many notable films. These include Annie Get Your Gun, released in 1950, Showboat, released in 1951, and the highly iconic Sunrise, released in 1972, which is considered one of the most important achievements in cinematography. Conrad L. Hall is a legendary American cinematographer who is known for many classic westerns. He was born in 1926 and lived until recently after he died in 2003. Conrad was best known for his approach to cinematography, as he did not follow the conventional rules of the time. He left many mistakes in his work, from lens flares to dirt on the lens of the camera. These mistakes would often be rectified, but these mistakes seemed to be very effective when they were used in his films, and lens flares are now a very common feature to see in many, many films. This approach helped pave the way to gritty independent films. He won two Oscars, one in 1969 for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and later won an Oscar 30 years later for American Beauty. His most notable films include Cool Hand Luke, which was released in 1967, American Beauty, released in 1999, and Road to Perdition, released in 2002.